Um, thank you so much, Rajeshri, uh, and thank you so much, all of you, uh, Professor Barua, for the um, for your for your introduction and also introducing the the event. Uh, so, uh, at the very outset, I wish to you know sincerely apologize that I'm not putting my video on because while the introduction was going on, I was kicked out of the meeting because of my um, because of my poor internet connection. So I'm not taking the liberty to put my video on. Maybe I'll be doing it later. Uh, so let me go directly to the perspectives that I wish to share. Now, um, at the very outset of my set of reflections, I would like to uh, clarify my positionality. I would like to clarify my positionality because I don't want to end up generalizing my arguments. So it, it is important for me to share with you that uh, from which perspectives my uh, arguments in this particular presentation emerges from. Now, I have been in Banaras Hindu University, so I was in BHU uh, for 10 years. That is from 2008 to 2018. I, I went there as an undergraduate student, and then I, after finished my finishing my PhD, I um, I left that place. So I have been in that institution for ten years. So a lot of my arguments emerge uh, with respect to my experiences uh, in that institution, and also along with that, it also merges with respect to the experiences that have been shared. Uh, that have been shared with me with, uh, by my colleagues who are associated uh, uh, with the institutions in different other higher education institutions in Uttar Pradesh, in New Delhi, and West Bengal. So widely, the arguments that I have shaped here that I'm about to share with you in this set of reflections emerges uh, basically from these set of experiences that I have. And also I would like to share that I'm not going to speak a lot about or theorize a lot about the history of racism and the different types of racism. Obviously it's going to uh, come up with respect to my set of reflections as I keep on reflecting on the different sets of racism that uh, usually uh, takes place or is usually practiced um, within, the, within the higher education institutions of India. Uh, but what is? Uh, but I really don't want to speak about the history of racism because I mean, the various academic and non-academic spaces have generated multiple volumes of really very important set of works on racism. But what really uh, makes me as an individual upset is that still uh, when we see that the pedestals of racism are still very much intact, and not only they are intact, but with the passage of time, how they have mutated into various visible and invisible forms of racism. And so basically, despite creating such scholarly works, obviously, when I'm sharing this point, this doesn't mean that I wish to cancel all the scholars, scholarly works as useless. Obviously, I'm not doing that. I have a huge respect toward those works and they have generated some wonderful set of arguments with respect to racism and different other perspectives. But what I wish to say is, or what I wish to draw your attention towards is the massive gap that exists between the theories and the praxis. So obviously, Theoretically, uh, there's no doubt we have generated ample of volumes of work on racism. We, we are doing it right now in the near future also we are going to do. And not just across the world, like in India itself, we are you know, creating so many discourses on racism from so many different dimensions. That's there. But then the question remains the same. Then why do we actually see or why do we actually experience 
not only such varieties of racism, such diverse ways of racializing communities and racializing individuals in the country, not only that, but also how they are being so systematically embedded within our habitual life that either we fail to realize, or even if we are realizing, we are ignoring it in a very systemic manner. Why we are doing that? So this means, obviously, the, the very thing that comes to the forefront is that there lies a huge gap between theory and praxis. Now, obviously, uh, when this perspective comes to the forefront that there lies a gap between the theory and praxis, what could be the possible factors? Obviously, there are a lot of factors, but one particular factor that I wish to focus on in today's lecture is that our failure, our collective failure to understand the transition of racism beyond the color line towards the epistemic line. Now, what do I mean by beyond the color line towards the epistemic line to simplify this argument further, which actually also I have mentioned categorically in the abstract of my lecture as well, that obviously uh, racism centrally emerged with the color binaries, um, black skin, white skin, um, then, then you have fair skin, uh, almost black, almost white, and all sorts of, you know, illogical, weird categories of, you know, racializing communities on the basis of skin color. But also we have to understand that racism was not just based on skin color. Racism was based on knowledge systems. Racism has been based on residential areas. Racism has been based on one's affiliation to educational institutions. Racism has been based on one's linguistic affiliations, the kind of languages they speak, and so many one's religions, one's religious order, one's, one's ethnical, uh, you know, ethnical belongingness, and so many other factors, you know, that has been contributing towards shaping racism and towards shaping the practice of racism in the contemporary era. But unfortunately, what we see is a majority of the discourses still revolve around this color line. And we fail to realize that beyond the color line, there also exist so many other dimensions of racism. Some are very much visible and some are obviously, you know, kind of invisible and very much embedded within our behavioral patterns, fashion ethics and other kind of practices. Now, why does happen so? Like, why do we fail? to realize this transition. And even if we realize this transition, why we don't want to accept. And this actually is what actually, you know, triggers the question, which is right there, uh, you know, in my, in my topic of presentation today, that is, are universities in India racist? I mean, this is one kind of question that comes to the mind of the people because of a failure to understand this transition. Now, the, one of the major reasons for our failing to understand this transition is still, you know, the uncritical acknowledgement about the narratives of racism, the uncritical acknowledgement about the narratives of racism that have been generated, that have been created by the European scholars and also the Eurocentric scholars. So obviously, it's not just the heteronormative white, patriarchal, blue-eyed, fair-skinned European scholars, not only them, but also you see these kind of, you know, these kind of, of discourses are also being created by the very people around us who are not Europeans, who belong to the space which actually is the ex-colonial space or who has been the victims of the you know, colonial functionalities, but they also in a way you know, generate these discourses. They also in a way create these discourses, support these kind of narratives that were once created by the Europeans. And it happens in various ways. It happens in the kind of publishing houses where you produce your works on racism. It happens on the basis of the review reports, who generate those review reports, who create those ideas, 
who actually ask you to change your writing, what kind of changes you are expected to do, and so many, you know, it's, it's very complex and entangled, so many other factors that contribute. And, and the first is obviously the uncritical acknowledgement. The second is, you know, the lack of interest in investigating and producing scholarships on epistemic racial experiences. And that, that is the second reason why such kind of questions come that are universities in India racist. I mean, it's such a kind of loose question. If somebody asks me this, I mean, it's such a kind of loose question because racism in the universities and other educational institutions in India are actually sometimes they are so visible. And also, even if they're invisible, we do have the intellectual capability, do, we do have the experiential capability to realize them. So the second thing is the lack of interest in investigating, just people are not interested because a, a very illogical thought has been embedded in the mind of the people that, that racism in India has ended with the official conclusion of European colonization. So India has attained independence on 15th August 1947, and it has ended everything that was colonial. So racism has also ended with that. So the thing is, so we should not even talk about that. So there are a lot of people who believe that we should not even talk about that because that's illogical. Racism can't exist in India. So the lack of enthusiasm and the interest in investigating and producing scholarships about epistemic racism in India. Now, the third reason why such kind of, why we have failed to understand this transition towards epistemic racism is, you know, even if scholarships are being produced in the country, what is happening is they are not acknowledged. Now, they are not widely acknowledged because the problem is, you know, the comfort zones of the gatekeepers of racial hierarchies in India and the gatekeepers are like everywhere, the politicians, um, the educationists, you have the businessmen and all sorts of people, all sorts of people who actually gatekeeps racism, the practices of racism in India, you know, uh, they don't want these works to come to the forefront and for obvious reasons, because, you know, their zones of comfort will be questioned. Their zones of being what actually Franz Fanon often talks about in his works. You know, if you look into uh, black skin, white masks, if we look into uh, the region of the earth, we see that he mentions that there are two clear zones of existence. One is a zone of being and the other is a zone of non-being. So the zones of, in both these zones, as you know, and since I brought, you know, um, Franz Fanon into our discourse today, so very to briefly, very briefly mention where he says that both the zones are occupied by both whites and non-whites. But the point is the kind of, the kind of, uh, existential state that you are in actually qualifies you to be the zone of being and the zone of non-being where you are both the zones have operation but the intensity of operation is different so here what you have is these gatekeepers occupy those zones of being not realizing the fact that once they were actually subjects of operation for the colonizers or for the very colonial ideologies that they are now supporting so these are the three wide reasons uh, I, I identify, and obviously, I mean, there are multiple other reasons as well, but I practically identify these are the three wide reasons why we have failed to transition or our understanding of racism from the color line to the epistemic line. And also just to share with you the trail, the, the, the trail of this discourse, like from where it emerges. So there are a lot of scholars like um, William Du Bois, uh, then Lewis Gordon. Uh, there are a lot of scholars within the continent of Africa as well and other parts of the world who have always argued and who keeps on arguing the fact that if we have to understand racism in a diverse way, it is important for us to transition our understanding beyond the color line into these epistemic enclaves 
what often many scholars like Ananya Jahanara Kabir and many other Southeast Asian, South Asian, other scholars from different parts of the world calls these pockets as epistemic enclaves where racism hides in a very systematic manner and it hides in such a way that we often, you know, fail to realize those enclaves. And even if they exist, we just make our mind or we just have a kind of, you know, predetermined thought that racism might not exist in those spaces, but they are very much there and prominently. Now, the, what, what is important is if we, you know, look into this, the ways through which, you know, these violences are hidden. Now, now obviously, because today I'm engaging my discourse within the uh, case of higher educational institutions in India. So my point is, or what I'm trying to look into is that what are the uh, you know, ways in which racism or what are the systematic ways in which racism is both visibilized and invisibilized within the higher education institutions of India. And that actually works at every step of our existence or every step of our interaction with the institution it can be we might experience racism as a as a faculty member we might experience racism as any other staff members or as a student or somebody else so racism within the higher educational institutions in india is very common is very prominent but the question is what happens and again as i said widely this, this argument emerges with respect to my experiences at BHU is either it is totally rejected or it is totally ignored that no, these, these so-called practices, uh, you know, they are not racism, they are not problematic and you should not create a fuss around this, okay? In the number one. Or even if they're realized, they are given different names. Okay, that, that can be a gender issue, that can be a political issue, that can be a personal strife, that is often said as a kind of personal rife, nothing more than that. But they will never acknowledge that it was actually a clear cut experience of racism. It was a clearly visible performance of racism. Still, these terms, the universities remain reluctant in India to engage with these terms on a habitual basis. Now, again, the question comes, why? Why there is such a kind of reluctance towards racism, towards accepting and acting against racism within the higher education institutions? And the number one argument that I understand as is the case of hipster racism. Now, what is hipster racism? And again, from where do I um, draw this argument? Now, just to simplify a complex idea, hipster racism, it simply means that you hide or we all hide our racial practices within the discourse of being outgoing, being smart, being radical, being friendly and being, you know, thinking about the welfare of the so society around us. So that is what actually hipster racism does. So where you take, for example, a, a very simple example, we often crack jokes. We often see people cracking jokes, you know, that amounts to body shaming, that amounts to, you know, uh, making a joke about somebody's shape of the body, somebody's skin color, somebody's hairstyle, somebody's way of dressing, somebody's way of eating, and so many other aspects that come to the forefront. So what you see is basically that, you know, these kind of jokes we see people are sharing with each other on a daily basis. And when somebody comes up or somebody comes out, you know, vocally sharing that what you are basically regarding as a joke is not a joke, but it's a kind of insult. It's a form of racial, ethnic, cultural insult. 
then people just bypass it as oh you see it's a joke if you can't take a joke you should not be with us it's just a joke you you should laugh at these jokes take it easy you should not always you know be so critical about everything so you know this is a a, a very a basic example of hipster racism just to share in general obviously i'm going to uh, build my arguments surrounding hipster racism uh, with respect to how it gets you know reflected within the educational institutions of india so the first thing is uh, there is this very interesting essay from basically uh, where i draw this argument and this essay is written by um, chris current and emily tillotson um and obviously uh, this essay is titled hipster racism and they have talked about hipster racism obviously in a different context in us but the definition that they come up with i find is very relevant to the context that i'm speaking to so basically as they argue that you know that hipster racism is basically a form of social practice their individual says that you see i am trying to be charitable for the society i am trying to do good for the society and through these problematic discourses of being a do gooder of being a charitable uh, through their discourses on charitability they actually very you know strategically preserve their racial hierarchies and to understand this the concept of hipster racism further it is also important for us to refer to the concept of uh, you know abstract liberalism which actually these two authors also draw from their concept of hipster racism so uh, there is another very uh, you know um, scholar who writes a lot about capitalism and its impact on the current world and his, his name is eduardo bonilla silva so eduardo uh, bonilla silva uh, in his in his very interesting book racism without racists in his very interesting book racism without racists actually writes down, down that there is this something this very practice of hipster racism emerges from a experience of abstract liberalism now the question is what is abstract liberalism and bonilla silva argues that it is a form it's it's like a very loose concept and it is where you know where racism where the practice of racism is regarded as someone's individual choice where the practice of racism is regarded as someone who is not generating as a collective effort so racism basically abstract liberalists argue that racism doesn't emerge as a collective effort it is not a result of a structured collective justification of thought but rather it is just an individual choice so you you just can't simply tell that all whites are racists or you simply can't tell that all europeans are racists or all the colonizers were racists so this is the kind of concept that you know uh, many many white eurocentric scholars or white tend eurocentric scholars argue about racism that is about it's a kind of abstract liberalism so racism must according to them according to the abstract liberalists racism must be treated individually so you just can't blame a community you just can't blame a historical phase as a form of racial phase so according to them basically the transatlantic slave trade was not an act of racism basically for them the indian ocean slave trade was not an act of racism basically for them everybody didn't take in slaves so those who never owned slaves were not racist so they come up with these kind of problematic discourses and you know if we look at the functioning of the higher educational institutions in india i mean we see a very similar kind of picture in the country as well a very very similar a very identical kind of picture then let us take some and where we see that how hipster racism gets projected through caste based religion based community based gender based and also ethnic based racism as well again with respect to you know what i usually see 
in the universities in in uttar pradesh in new delhi in west bengal and also in many other parts of india you will see by default a majority of the vice chancellors just giving very categorical examples a majority of the vice chancellors they are basically by default high caste hindus and to be specific they are mostly brahmins high caste hindu brahmins even if they're brahmins but they are mostly the upper hindu caste of people yeah obviously you have um differences and as i mean mostly apart from the very community named uh, uh, you know universities like aligarh muslim university have a muslim vice chancellor or a madras christian college have a christian head of the department and so on and so forth or a a tribal university has a tribal vice chancellor etc you know apart from these kind of very compartmentalized institutions the major thing you see is by default even outside the university space also if you look at the ceos of the companies and all you see it's mostly the you know the hindu high caste people the same kind of picture you also see in case of when you look at the head of the departments the deans or other high class administrative posts in the educational institutions by default it it will be in the hands of the high caste hindus especially when you look into the organizations based in west bengal uttar pradesh and new delhi the question is why is it so the very simple question it's a simple question i mean so it basically you know what happens here comes this this fraud fraudulent image of charitability here comes this fraudulent discourse of charitability what happens the first of all we are already aware of the fact we it is not necessary for us to talk separately about that how much uh, the different non hindu communities in india religious communities in india and also within hindus in the hindu community we see the low caste people the low caste communities and the outcasted communities like the dalits and so on and so forth how much they are subjected to dehumanization on a habitual basis now um so it it happens in a very systematic manner so first of all they are intellectually sterilized by not letting them to access have access to education have access to pro- proper health have access to proper living and always pushing them into a state of crisis so that they don't get that scope you know of having the kind of knowledge exposure like the rest of the people from the so called elitist caste and class backgrounds now after they are subjugated and after they are not allowed to pursue in their life to pursue their dreams to pursue their intellectual growth then these people the so called gatekeepers of high caste class as racism in india they come up with this charitable discourse that you see we are very open hearted we are very open minded we wish that people from every class ethnic caste religious communal gender background should have equal access to education but unfortunately you don't see them coming forward and then they are going to you know create all sorts of imaginary discourses that you know historically and then they go back to all those scriptures those ancient scriptures that historically they have chosen this as their occupation xyz as their occupation so they still want to be a part of that occupation they don't want to come forward and even if they get scopes they misuse the money etc and so many other forms of complex logic that are being presented to justify the fact that why these racial gatekeeping has to be continuously practiced in the higher education institutions in india and now in case in case what happens if there are a few people who by chance who are able to face this tremendous level of systematic dehumanization and still pursue hard and emerge as someone who is academically 
very, very prominent as a prominent scholar, then there is an other way of suppressing them. What is the other way of suppressing them? That is celebration and glorification. So first is suppression. Now, when these voices are suppressed, the headache is gone. But obviously, there are voices who are going to resist, who are going to come forward, and who are going to emerge as very powerful. What to do with them? They will also be suppressed through celebration and glorification. Now, what happens in that celebration and glorification? So that's why what happens when we, uh, for instance, I think it was last year or last year, last year, when in one of the universities in Charkhand, it was for the second time in India's history that a women vice chancellor from an indigenous, native indigenous community of Charkhand was appointed as a vice chancellor. So what happens? We celebrate that, which is obviously important. We need to celebrate that. We need to acknowledge that. But in the process of celebration, what happens? We tend to forget that this is on the one side a matter of celebration, but on the other side, it is also an alarming thing that in the history of India, there is just second, this is the second appointment of a vice chancellor who happens to be one of the indigenous communities from India. We forget, often tend to forget that alarming part. We are so much lost in the celebration. And then they end up in a kind of extra glorification. And as we end up in the process of glorification, so that's why what happens? You will see still people will say, yes, 10 years back, something like this happened to tell how much India has progressed. 15 years back, something has happened to tell how much India has proceeded after British colonization. So, you know, this kind of over glorification, this kind of celebration of over glorifying discourses is actually a very systematic way. And these are being so much supported by the gatekeepers. Why do the gatekeepers support it? Because they know very well that if we let the people, you know, tend to be distracted towards this over glorifying celebration of these achievements, then the reality, then the skeletal reality then the real crisis can be very much hidden. So that's why you have the media, you have the political organizations, you have award ceremonies, you have newspaper coverages, and you are lost into that, lost into that to a, such an extent that, you know, when people come up with writings, when people come up with discourses, that we also need to alternatively think of the crisis that it exposes, a lot of people fail to accept that. And you can look at the comments, you can look at the reactions of what people have on the social media. So you see, and this is why, you know, this is another major reason. And just to, apart from this, just to give you a few more examples, oh, and also oh, I will oh. wrap it up quickly so that we have also time for Q&A. Um, you see, if you also remember in 2019, uh, a huge chaos broke out in the campus of Banaras Hindu University because a Muslim, uh, a, a Muslim scholar was appointed as an assistant professor in the department of Sanskrit. And, the, the, and he was actually forced to resign. He was systematically forced to resign. And the protest of appointing a Muslim scholar as a faculty in the Sanskrit department was very systematically organized. And you see the institutions, the university, faculties from the department and the students, they all played a collective role to ensure that this person do not stay in our institution. Very recently, it's a matter of few weeks back where the JNU in New Delhi has introduced a course on Islamophobia and where they basically, in Islamophobia, they directly blame the Muslims for spreading Islamophobia in India and across the world. How it is happening so easily, so smartly, and so systematically? Now, we all know, because we are associated with different educational institutions, we all know that how does a particular course get launched in an institution? You just can't sit up personally and launch a course. It has to go through several phases of 
filtering of acceptance and then it is institutionally accepted how an education institution is accepting such courses that actually produces and reproduces such problematic abusive so you see how natural it is happening and also another thing another very important thing is the kind of way in which the people which which the students from the northeastern parts of india are perceived as lack of intelligence that they are they lack intelligence they are intellectually weak in many so called reputed quote unquote mainstreamed quote unquote educational institutions of india and 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 that is kind of you know so much visible it's so much visible you know through through different kind of activities for example just to uh, you know uh, come to the last part of my reflections where i saw like in bhu i categorically remember that you know the in the hostels just giving you very practical examples how they are systematically sidelined in the hostels we used to have different wings you know and the students from the northeast in the boys hostel and also i have heard from my colleagues from the girls hostel that they will always stay in a separate wing they are not going to stay along with or by default they are not going to share their room with somebody who is not from the northeastern part of india now why is it so why this practice of separatism now on pen on paper there is no such rule but you can clearly clearly understand when you interact with them or you see the people from the local people from up and other parts like up new delhi west bengal or other parts of india you know when they are interacting with them how much they are cornered how every time they are made to feel that you are not a part of our space you are not a part of our knowledge space and this is how they are systematically sidelined and there are others various examples of you know invisible racism in india in educational institutions in india in our classrooms in bhu we will see that how northeastern students students from the northeastern part of india they will always sit in the one corner all sitting together after the classroom will break out you will see everybody is interacting with each one of them but you don't see really people are interested to interact with them why is it so again an example of invisible racism also in 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 terms of appointment as well if you look at the number of people number of scholars from north eastern part of india working in different parts of india you see usually very usually their concentration is in a few institutions either the institution is about tribal studies or the institution specifically deals with the northeastern studies or the institution widely deals with ethnic studies in south asia and very few number of people who are part of the english department otherwise you don't see their concentration really they are not very equally spread in all the fields of knowledge all the departments all the faculty spaces why is it so because very systematically they have been ethnically marginalized not only you know it and it has been happening since the colonial era and it continues it continues to take place in the post colonial era as well today as well with they are systematically marginalized with respect to by by creating these kind of problematic discourses you know where they are said they are less intelligent they are incapable they are not interested in education they are interested in drugs and dance and blind followers of western culture so you you know they keep on creating and inventing these kind of rhetoric this problematic rhetoric to define them and to keep on subjugating them so you know these examples kind of reveal so the question remains the same and today's reflection for me is not about finding or sharing a set of solutions because we have or we are very aware of the fact that m like endless number of solutions have been shared till date endless number of uh, you know uh, possibilities have been shared till date 
but there has been no real change because there is a critical lack of implementation. There is a clear lack of implementation. And to end up, to, to, to wrap up, the, the one last thing is, this is something, you know, the systematic racism that I just shared with respect to, you know, different examples is what actually, you know, another very, uh, you know, great scholar of who, who engages with racism, gender studies, apartheid studies, and so many different other facets is Melissa Steen. And and um, she writes, she, she's from South Africa and from the very institution uh, with which I'm associated to right now. And she writes on invisible contract. And, you know, she has this very interesting article on invisible contract. And again, she obviously her argument is with respect to is centered on apartheid, uh, like in so South Africa at the time of the apartheid. But again, I find it very relevant to our context in India as well where she says that, you know, this ignorance is contractual. You know, this ignorance is not something which we should regard as not happening. This in ignorance is very performative. This ignorance is very much visible. And it happens so systematically that, you know, people, you know, just simply ignore it. That because, as I have already mentioned, is that previously we have with this predetermined idea that, okay, racism doesn't exist, or even if it is exist, we are so much into this ignorance contract. And who are the playmakers of this ignorance contract? You see, uh, you know, the elitist communities, the institutions, the gatekeepers, the political gatekeepers, the cultural gatekeepers, the ethnic gatekeepers, and all those other elitist problematic, abusive gatekeepers who actually maintains this ignorance contract. Well, I think I should stop here. I have spoken enough. Um, you know, thank you so much for listening. Obviously, I, I stop in an incomplete state so that we can continue with the discussion. And there are so many things to say and discuss. But yes, I think it's, it's good if I stop here and look forward to your comments, reflections, agreements, and disagreements or whatever. Thank you so much once again. Yeah, uh, thank you for that, Sayan, uh, for that very thought-provoking lecture. I request uh, Dr. Rakhi Kolida Moral to provide her concluding remarks and to open up the session for Q&A. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Rajeshri, and uh, thank you, Dr. Sayan De for that very provocative uh, uh, talk and for what seems to be in higher education uh, institutes in India uh, and what I imagine is an extension of uh, global uh, campuses, uh, a, a problem of, uh, of, uh, of existing, of, uh, of adjusting and of being able to accommodate and uh, also being able to point out uh, when the time comes uh, that, hey, this is not right. So I loved uh, uh, your, uh, you know, the take in your uh, lecture, especially because while it renders this entire uh, canvas to us uh, so, so, so openly, you know, it's a very, very straightforward and it's a very overt uh, understanding of what really transpires uh, both in the educational scenario as well as uh, what is generally a behavioral pattern in post-colonial societies, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a large sense, uh, in the manner that you pitch your, uh, your essay, your, your, your paper. 
So I was, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite sort of taken in by some of your comments and I'm going to very quickly uh, kind of go through a, a, a summing up of what I think were the main points that you made. And indeed, at a time when we are, um, uh, you know, sliding into what is a post-capital, a post-post-colonial, um, a post-ultra-nationalistic uh, uh, global experience, if I may be allowed to say that, uh, there is indeed an attempt uh, to invisibilize a lot of our differences and a lot of our diversities. And I understand, uh, Dr. Sayande, where you're coming from, because uh, uh, you know your, your interest in equality mandate, uh, your background in, in diversity studies, uh, really points to this uh, very important discourse that is in the making and a discourse that we must all share in, a discourse which is about inclusion and which is anti-racist, a, uh, a discourse which must take into account um, at the very beginning, as you stated, you know, our different positionalities. And I think this positionality is important that you began with. This is a positionality which, uh, you know, uh, brings you, uh, we, we know that it, it emanates from your, uh, in, in many ways, from your Northern uh, uh, Indian, uh, you know, uh, uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, New Delhi, and of course, a slice of West Bengal. Um, all of these uh, very Brahminical societies, if I may be allowed to say that, uh, you know, kind of uh, 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 allowing you to participate in what is very visibly a racist society. Uh, one of the important points that you also make about uh, our current uh, uh, educational uh, agendas, uh, and particularly, you know, uh, the manner in which higher education is structured and framed uh, is this vast and somehow unbridgeable gap between theory and praxis, which we continually, we, we, we always face this in the classroom. You know, we know that we say certain things in the, in the textbook, whereas we experience certain other things um, through our uh, ontological uh, experiences and our everyday lives and everyday practices. So uh, I, I was interested in, uh, in the fact that uh, you, you try to interrogate what lies beyond the color line. I mean, the color line creates a very easy binary, right? And we've had it since you know the 19th century and we talk about Western uh, theory of racism, uh, the beginning of critical race theory, uh, you know, Du Bois and, and the rest, bringing in uh, the, uh, you know, the critique of the Jim Crow laws, et cetera, in the West where it began. But the kind of racism that now prevails in post-colonial societies such as ours. And I'm wondering, uh, Sayan, if, um, if, if, if one is gesturing, if you are gesturing towards a form of mimicry almost, you know, in Baba's famous formulation, are we also looking at a kind of repetitive difference in our own societies, you know, and in the manner that racism exists in what are understood to be liberal societies, uh, but where we have not had slave trade, for example, where we have not overtly have had the color line, for example, but we do have structural and systemic forms of racism embedded in the higher education institutions and in the HEI experiences where there are hidden strands. And I love this metaphor of hidden, you know, hidden transcripts, hidden symbols, uh, hidden racism, and our consistent attempts to invisibilize them. I think this is what I, I, I got. This is a major takeaway from uh, what you're trying to say. Uh, and also the very provocative idea of a fraudulent image of charit charitability. Uh, how, 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 you know, the discourse is erected to actually camouflage racist discriminations. Uh, so we constantly on the one hand practice racist, um, non-inclusive elite discriminations uh, and, and we constantly erect, uh, erect hierarchies of power, class, status, gender, you know, and, and race. But at the same time, 
we constantly, uh, you know, manufacture a discourse which uh, sort of is attempting is attempting to camouflage it, and 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 then the simultaneous glorification in our national policies, in our social uh, practices, and in the many discourses that are uh, obviously you know pushed by both um, both governmental and probably uh, you know various national and international agencies that pitch for inclusion and diversity on the one hand and glorify it while there is a lot of gatekeeping. And I, 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 I like that term, uh, especially the kind of gatekeeping that we constantly see in terms of who is allowed and who is not, who is given the job and which are the communities that are not. So uh, you've, you've, you've laid down a, a very, uh, um, you know, a very realistic, but at, but at the same time, a very provocative stage here, where we know how the West exists exists and has existed for a long time, um, and and what are the replications that are happening also in our own context, uh, especially in in the higher education scenario. So I was wondering, Sayan, uh, uh, you know, having said and having summed up. In, in, in whatever way I, I could pick up uh, the major strands of your argument, I might want to ask you uh, uh, a couple of things. And this, what I might particularly want you to respond to is how would you comment then on, uh, on say, on, on, on the critical race theory paradigm that exists on this great uh, space and value that we give to critical race theory, both in literary cultural studies, as well as you know, in anthropology and sociological studies at the present times, and how it exists in the US you know, with a long tradition of criminal justice policies, say for example, in the 1990s made very famous, and then followed more recently by the Black Lives uh, Matter movement, perhaps um, George Floyd, as we all know, very recently. And yet, and yet, Dr. Sayande, the need to remove CRT from the curricula in certain institutions in Northern America, which you must be familiar with, this recent legislation uh, in certain universities where uh, in Northern America, where critical race theory is also seen as destructive is also seen as um, negative. So I would want you to comment on that, one. And two, I'm also wondering, uh, because you did mention you know, your own experience uh, about being in campuses, uh, and especially your reference to the, con uh, to the enclave of, say, Northeast India students, students from uh, Northeast India in the capital, for example, in, in larger campuses like JNU or in Delhi University or elsewhere, where uh, the, the tendency to, to isolate, to marginalize and to label and stereotype them is one of the most violent forms of racism that exists in our country and that we've been constantly witnessing and, and helplessly witnessing, right? So I was wondering if you might want to comment on how at a time when um, uh, at a time when both cultural and critical and literary studies, uh, theoretical studies are all moving towards a, a, a much larger view of the world. And we are also looking at uh, what seems to be away from the human, you know, we are moving away from our, our human centeredness, our anthropomorphic centeredness. I'm also wondering if, uh, this tendency to lump and homogenize students and uh, and even faculty from a particular region submerging submerges the race question and uh, in a, in in one sense uh, does it allow do you think that it is it, it it is constantly kind of creating pools of resources for those who are at the upper end of the ladder. Right. So is this a, a method? Is this a because I'm also reminded of Pierre Bordeaux, 
you know, Pierre Bordeaux's theory of education and race, his theory of critical race and education, where he said that, you know, the international studies uh, program in Northern America and in Europe was one attempt to homogenize students with diversities, with students who were different and to kind of, in a sense, lump them together. So I'm wondering if the proposal that Bordeaux put, to, put, put out in the intellectual habitus, and he said that this intellectual habitus, and to use Bordeaux's own term, um, steamrolls diversity. Could it be an interesting point? Could it be an interesting entry point from which to pitch your own understanding of how higher education institutions in India in this global society practice racism. Thank you very much. No, absolutely. Uh, I mean, thank you so much for uh, your, your set of reflections and uh, for that detailed um, analysis of my reflections uh, and also coming up with these two very important questions. And I think they're also very, um, very much interlinked with each other. Now, coming to the first question about critical race theory. Now, the question is um, critical race theory as an academic paradigm or as a disciplinary paradigm um, centrally emerged, obviously, uh, from the aspect of racism as an epistemic line, because that's why we already had race theories or set of race theories in place. But then the question arises why there was a necessity of bringing critical race theory, why we have to add a critical element or into not only in terms of name, but also in terms of practice is to understand that racism is not just based on the color line, but also in other aspects as well. And as you have rightly mentioned that um, about the Black Lives Matter and then a lot of other movements movements as well. Uh, for example, fees must fall movement uh, that emerged widely in South Africa and right in the institution where I'm sitting right now. And then it actually spread in other parts of the world as well. Then you have the roads must fall movement where they wanted to, you know, dislocate the, uh, you know, the presence of Cecil John Rhodes' images in different universities in South Africa and also in UK and US. So, you know, these kind of uh, the, the, these kind of resistant movements actually could have been possible to present it in a very logical, structured manner, obviously because of the presence of critical race theory as a paradigm. Now, that is, I mean, that is one of the major reasons why in many universities, the elitist, again, the uh, gatekeepers of the white Eurocentric gatekeepers across the world are so much feeling threatened about the critical race theory. And, and the honest thing is, I mean, the, the colonizers have always presented them in general, the colonizers have always presented them, tried to present themselves as smart and outgoing and always ahead of the non-whites across the world. But that feeling or that presentation doesn't come out or doesn't emerge out of an honest feeling of confidence. It actually emerges out of a feeling of extreme threat because they were from the beginning very much aware of the fact they were always threatened by this global diversity of existence. They were always threatened by this racial diversity, cultural diversity, and linguistic diversity. So that's why they felt so much threatened about it that they always wanted to whitewash them remove them, dismantle them, vanquish them completely from the face of the earth. And that is why basically out of several reasons, one of the basic major reason why the project of colonization was launched. So even today, that's why they are so much threatened by the critical race theory. Now, uh, many, many critics call it as critical race theory as threatening. And if you look at the criticism, mostly they emerge from the very privileged white centric knowledge spaces, whether it is within the educational institution or it is outside the educa educational institution. Uh, 
but from majority majority it emerges from those spaces and the reason is very clear to us why uh, number two many scholars who are also honest uh, celebrators of critical race theory they also often feel that it could be a threat because every theoretical paradigm has undergone misinterpretation as well as it has been justified it has been interpreted in a justifiable manner it has been misinterpreted as well now what is happening for example as i see widely in south africa now many universities what they're trying to do they're trying to look forward to establish a uh, all black indigenous space now in the process of doing that what is happening they are struggling with the infrastructural elements because the infrastructures are still white it's you know it's that the typical phenonian dimension of black skin white mask you see the the infrastructures are well established by the white centric people it's the very colonial infrastructures so they are not looking forward to dismantle those infrastructure what they are simply trying to do is to fit themselves within those infrastructures so what is happening is there are black bodies moving around but they are painted eternally all white so that's why again now if you now they are presenting this as a critical race theoretical approach now when you do this kind of misinterpretations obviously critical theory critical race theory loses its necessity loses its importance loses its goal and this actually also and in india the existence of critical race theory is zero let us be very honest even i mean in terms of academic paradigm obviously it exists nowhere in no institutions even you have several centers of african studies in new delhi and the university of delhi in jnu in university of bombay and other institutions but they hardly hardly engage with discourses on critical race studies number one mm -hmm. and the and the question is and, and another another important element is that in india it is i think very necessary to bring in this and this actually connects to your second question where if we have to really teach racism it has to begin from the very tender age after a birth of a child it has to begin right from the family where discourses are very common that i want i don't want my child to be of dark skin color i want my child of fair skin color or i don't want my child to play with the son or the daughter of the housemaid who is working because they are dirty they are illiterate they are going to teach the child bad languages etc so you know the the very gatekeeping as you were saying the the way the elitist knowledge systems are being racially preserved in our institutions who have that logic who have that audacity on a daily basis to subjugate the various other forms of knowledge systems through the idle state apparatuses through the repressive state apparatuses and so on and so forth it emerges from that very basic point because they have been it has been intergenerate generationally filtering into yeah. to our minds it's embedded within us that's why anything we see black even if we are not sure what is black and what is white immediately we don't have let's be honest to each other we don't have the same kind of feeling if we approach something black as compared to white another reason why we are very very you know uh, afraid of darkness why we are are not very fond of darkness obviously there are a lot of psychological uh, mental physical elements but also there is a racial connotation because it has been embedded within our psyche to such an extent that it gets naturally reproduced within us these kind of very basic you know racial 
hierarchies. And that's why ultimately it grows along with us. And then the, you will see it's the same group of people who preach equality in the public. It is also the same group of people who practice racism in the private spaces. Yeah. So I think it has to go into a very basic, basic point from where do we need to look into the problem. And it has to start from the roots, from a very way we are educating our next generation, the way we are upbringing our next generation of people every time. Yeah. Yes, I'll stop here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sayan. Um, interesting arguments. And also, perhaps a lot of our students here and our audience have questions for you. We can see the chat box. So perhaps our moderator, uh, Rajeshri and others, Payal, are you there? Thank you, Sayan. That was a wonderful talk and it resonated with a lot of what I had gone through. I spent 12 years of my life in Delhi doing my graduation, master's and field and a few years of teaching. And so from being asked, how come you Northeasterners are always in the college because Northeastern people don't come to college every day. From being asked that question to being laughed at during an interview for a job where I had spoken about my interest in Bodo literature. I come from the Bodo tribe. And so I had spoken about my interest in Bodo literature and I was laughed at. Um, uh, so I have gone through all of that and it resonated very much with me. After, uh, in, in, when in 2015, I joined Cotton University in Assam. Uh, it was through the Assam Public Service Commission. And I was told by my people, the Bodo people, I was reminded that, remember, you are the first Bodo to join the English Department of Cotton College a more than 100 years of your college. And so you are right when you speak about the systemic racism that goes on through the educational institutions in uh, you know, admissions, in, uh, you know, in appointments. And I often talk to my students about how this institutional racism exists very subtly sometimes. We don't even realize it. And many a times we ourselves internalize it. And that is how internalized racism works. It against even our own people. Right. So uh, thank you very much for speaking up, for putting all of these uh, to us. There are a lot of interesting questions here, which you might want to look at. Uh, do you want to take all the questions at one go or should I ask one by one? There is. Uh, um, maybe it, it's good if we just go one by one. So I think that would be one. better. Yes. So yes. uh, Kostab Kashya, he's a PhD scholar in our department. Uh, he refers to this, uh, you know, higher education institutes and how uh, certain uh, syllabi, the syllabi in higher education, how they are formed, right? And he speaks about the university and how Bama and Sukartini, uh, they are, have been dropped from the syllabus. And he questions, how do we formulate a politics of resistance in a situation where a pro-Hindu Tua government is muzzling the dissent on diversity. Yeah, I mean, uh, let me add the very, uh, thank you so much, first of all, for asking this very important uh, question, Kostar. Uh, and also let me be very honest. I don't have an immediate answer. And as I don't want to come up with an immediate answer. The, oh, yes, we can do this, we can do that, because we have been doing that for a long period of time with no results. Now, what could be, if you, if you want a response from me right now, what could be the possibilities? Now, the possibilities, first of all, you know, identifying the right points from where the problem emerge. Now, see, if we have to address a disease, we have to take the right medicine. If I'm having stomach problems, I can't take a medicine for headache. Obviously, that's not going to help me out. So the issue with us is, a major issue with us is, amongst various issues, is we fail to address the right roots from where the problems are emerging. 
Now, this problems have been embedded in our society for several centuries. It's not just, you know, what you are asking about the pro-Hindutva government is doing right now. Obviously, they are doing something today. But how they can do it so systematically? They are able to do this so systematically because it has been embedded in our discourses for several, several centuries. So the question is, if we have to look for a resistance, if we have to create a resistance against pro-Hindutva government today, we have to see how we can uproot that toxic growth, those toxic growths which have already spread across and infected our society to a vast extent. How can we uproot those toxic growths from our society which has been very much systematized and embedded within us for so, so many centuries. How can we do that? How can we uproot that? Now, this uprooting, again, will take for several centuries. It just can't happen overnight, or it just can't happen in the next 10 years. We have, you know, the national education policy is, again, so problematic and again, so chaotic. It is five years plan, 10 years plan, 20 years plan, and it is yielding absolutely no result. You know, sometimes their focus is on decolonization. Sometimes their focus is on nature education, but ultimately it's all on pen and paper. Why? Because when we're addressing an issue, we are trying to do it, what I refer to as a patchwork solution. You know, we think that everything is like a medicine. Everything is like an allopathic medicine. We take a capsule, we are immediately getting immediate response, but the disease remains sub merged in a body and it comes up once again after a few years or few decades. That is how we are treating these issues, which is not going to help at all. And we can see it is not helping also. So the question is now, where to start? I go back to my same response that we need to start with our very way that we educate ourselves and our next generation of people, our colleagues and our next generation. The change should come from within. The within, the, it starts with the process that from the very childhood days, we must be launched into critical thinking. We just can't say everything, oh, this is a, he is a kid or she is a kid. That's why he or she is behaving like, like this. We can't do that. Everything cannot be said that, you know, kiddishly treated. Because those are the things that remains embedded within us as those wrong things remain embedded within us as right things. And then we grow up to create and manufacture these matrices of hierarchies and abuses. So one point to begin, probably one point to begin is obviously from the very way, um, from a childhood days, the way we educate ourselves, the way we look around the people, the way we understand the societies, the way we understand anatomies, biologies, and every aspect of our knowledge that has to undergo paradigmatic changes. And it is a collective effort. Two families, five people, 10 communities are doing it won't work like that. We all need to realize that first. And it has to be a collective effort in our own way. So that could be probably a beginning point. But again, as I mentioned, we have to go a long way. And I think it is important for us to figure out from where we should begin countering the issue. And it is not supposed to be in the contemporary era. It has to go back to the several centuries of that problematic past. I think I'll stop here. I don't know if I have uh, you know, responded partially to your question, at least. Thank you, Sam. There is another question from uh, Costa. He wants to know if racial discrimination is region specific in India, or, or and probably we can add caste specific. Yes, yes, absolutely. And it's very region specific. It's very region specific, and it's it, it's so visible. One thing is obviously, I mean, the way the students and the people and the like whosoever are working in whichever sectors, the way they are treated, uh, people coming from the northeastern parts of India, the way they are treated, I have spoken about that. You also see the same kind of shaming and naming the people who are from the southern part of India, the kind of attitude the people have from the, you know, uh, from the widely from the northern part of India, widely from the eastern part of India as well. I, I should be very honest with the kind of 
attitude people from West Bengal also have towards the people coming from the South with respect to their language, their dressing style, um, uh, their, their, their food cultures, their fashion sense. What are all these? These are clear practices of racism. You make comments, you, make, uh, you, you try to mimic their language, you know, try to you know, create funny alibis uh, with those. So what are those things? These are all very clear cut examples of racism. So absolutely, I mean, I, I, you know, totally support this point. It is very, very region specific. Uh, thank you. There is uh, Bhumika Devi. Uh, she's another research scholar from our department. She wants to know, do you think there is always a question of power involved in racism? And could you please comment on lookism? Can it also be included within racism? Oh, this is a, a, a very interesting question and a, a very interesting point that you have brought up, Bhumika, with respect to lookism. And uh, obviously, number one, the answer is again, yes, power structures are totally indulged in racism because racism is always is mixed with power and various other power centric dimensions. So obviously, uh, that is why, you know, you, you still see that a majority of the political leaders until and unless they are representing a particular community are mostly coming from the high class, high caste social structures. And uh, whether you see in terms of chief ministership or you see a majority of the ministers who actually hold the posts in most parts of the country at the state level, you see they're all part of the privileged class structure. And even if they're not part of the privileged class structure, even if you see people from the so-called underprivileged power structure, they are integrated into that privileged space um, because they pretend to be one like them. So they're also kind of psychologically proselytized to be one like them. And then they that act as a ticket for them to be a part of the power structure. So obviously it's always, whenever we talk of racism by default, we indulge ourselves in discourses on power. And lookism is absolutely there innumerable times you don't look into books you, you you just walk around the streets in any parts of india and you find people how much they are so much uh, you know obsessed with people's body shapes um, skin color the kind of makeup they put um, the kind of dress they are wearing etc and this lookism is absolutely a part of racism. I tell you an in interesting story. I mean, yesterday I was, you know, over lunch, I was meeting a, a good colleague of mine from the Department of Sociology. And she happens to be currently a PhD student there. And we were just talking about our homes and houses and parents. And so, you know, this di discourse came up that when she actually revealed that despite the fact that she doesn't really like wearing high heel shoes or high heel boots, she wears it. And then I asked her that, why do you compromise with your comfort just for the sake of fashion? I just asked her that. And she said that I have to do it for my mother. And when I asked her about more about it, she said that my mother always said or taught me from my childhood days that sneakers, Sandals, these are all for boys. If you, as a girl, if you have to look smart, if you have to look outgoing, if you have to look attractive, you must always wear high heel shoes, no matter what it happens. And, you know, this is obviously an example from South Africa I'm giving you, just one example, but you also see such kind of problematic discourse in India where, and, you know, another very interesting space of lookism, the best example is just look at marriage ceremonies. You know, you have to look good. Now, what are the parameters of, you know, looking good? You have to look fair. You have to have a certain ways your eyes needs to be done. Your nose should look in a certain way. Your lips should look in a certain way. You should dress in a certain way. You know, there are people who are so worried because they are, you know, heavily built, or if I use the word oversized, 
and they are always worried prior to the marriage that they need to get thin, otherwise they won't be accepted in the in-laws family or they are not going to get, you know, good alliances. So what are these? These are open, uh, openly acknowledged practices of lookism as a form of racism or racism as a form of lookism. Good that you brought up uh, marriage, you. weddings, uh, Zen. Uh, uh, nowadays, the bridal makeups, you know, because they follow a certain standard. All brides look the same, right? We have we often talk about that. Uh, anyways, our next uh, question is from Abhilash Kaushik. He's another uh, PhD scholar. He says, do you think that dismantling the so-called years of established norms of racism or social uh, or uh, racial studies is the way forward? If we don't, we inevitably succumb to it, although we don't want to. Isn't it then a double-edged sword? Um, see, uh, when we call about the dismantling the established norms of racism. Uh, now the question is, how do we dismantle? Yes, obviously we need to dismantle a lot of stereotypes about racism and which I have spoken, some of them I have touched upon in quite a details about the color element about certain other aspects. But the question is obviously it is a way of moving forward. But the question is how do we do that? Now obviously again I'm seeing, I mean obviously we just can't have immediate answers. I understand that uh, it is a, an urgent project. Obviously we have critical race studies as one of the paradigms uh, that Professor just mentioned a few moments back. And in India, one way could be obviously to bring in the critical race studies, but again, the challenges remain that there is always a fear that when you bring in a paradigm, when you bring in a new thought process, there is always a fear of getting assimilated and getting, you know, uh, what to say, assimilated and getting stuck in certain pockets and not being able to come out of it. So now if critical race studies comes in India and we are writing research papers and we are uh, you know, giving semester examinations and uh, you know, we are presenting papers in the conferences and that's the end of it. No, I don't think in that way it's going to really work. So we have to understand, yes, it's important to dismantle, but how and where to start? And we need to all come together and think collectively. Now, even in that collective thinking, we should not try to subjugate one voice and promote another. So it's it's a very complex, it's a very complex structure, you know, to you know really address it in a very concrete manner. I think for the time being, that's what I all have to say, Kabilash. I think uh, this is the, uh, we, okay, we are going to uh, pick up a last uh, comment and a question. This is uh, by Madhurjya Goswami. He's uh, another PhD scholar. This is a long post. You can see literary practice offers interpretive frames to make sense of the world around us. If that frame is carved out of a European and Brahminical model, how do we alert newly admitted students whose effective responses to literature are conditioned by their exposure to mainly white text to the fact that canon we have in place has been created out of a long legitimized epistemic violence on countless knowledge systems. Knee-jerk prescription of a paper on critical race theory alongside traditional papers doesn't exactly seem to be solution because of the simple fact that the theoretical works on CRT are dense and a new English literature student from a vernacular educational background would be at wit's end in making sense of them. Uh, would you like to add something to that? Yes, sure. Um, I think this is a very interesting point you raise. Now see, uh, 
and which actually if you if you're talking about how do we alert the students the question is obviously to alert the students is to introduce texts to them that have not been a part of their discourse so far but that has to be done in a systematic way right now see one thing that we all can do and that is doable is you know to and which can be initiated just amongst the phd students not just phd students you know the phd students can start that the faculties also can get involved in that and then the undergraduate and the master students can also come in what we usually do in a lot of universities across the world is to curate reading circles now in reading circles what happens reading circles are very informal spaces they are not you know so called institutionally tagged and institutionally approved stuff you just create reading circles amongst yourself for instance you know a, a few teachers and the students all come together and they decide that once a month we are going to meet they think that you know this is really problematic that when we indulge in research works and discourses we usually by default we talk about the very mainstreamed uh, the very mainstreamed uh, uh, texts that are so white centric that emerges from those white centric spaces we usually talk about those but we need to really dismantle ourselves disentangle ourselves from those problematic clutches so what shall we do one best way of doing is to create a, you know a reading circle where you all come together brainstorm together what you already know you just pitch in texts and then then those texts which might not have been read widely those texts which you as an individual you have read somewhere and you think it's very crucial it's very crucial in the current context or any other context and you introduce that text to your colleagues you know that is a way a very powerful way of building economies of care and share through emerging with new knowledge spaces through emerging with new knowledge systems and once you have those you know uh, those those spaces of reading circles in those reading circles what happens once you start discussing and once you regularize you know these spaces immediately what happens after a few months you see you are not the same person you're not any more the same person you are looking at the very critical dimensions in a more critical manner you're looking at the world around you in a more critical manner so the immediate way of introducing it is obviously you can start thinking about curating such you know personalized research spaces and you know this is one thing and the long term thing is obviously once you start and habitualizing these research spaces you know this informal research spaces where you have no hierarchies where you have open discussions where you also have your teachers and then you also have your undergraduate students without any prejudices coming interacting arguing agreeing disagreeing immediately you know this openness comes in our way of approaching ideas this kind of question it asks us to enables us to question everything before we appreciate it or criticize it everything needs to be questioned and so i may suggest is you may start thinking about you know having uh, these kind of informal spaces of interaction like reading circles which actually helps a lot actually to get introduced to these spaces and if you can regularize it just imagine that cotton university from today in the next 10 years or 20 years they are regularly monthly organizing this reading circle what a fantastic impact it is going to have on the students who are right there and also who are about to come in